Murphy and Phil Murphy and Diane Campbell and I are storytellers. Hi, Phil, wave your hand. There is Phil, there's Diane with her wonderful, wonderful quilt. Spellbinders is an organization, we've been around for over 14 years in Larimer County. There are 14 chapters of Spellbinders, mostly in Colorado. And we try to enhance literacy and encourage, you know, the character development within the schools. You know, last full year, we had 68 Spellbinder storytellers at the, uh, uh, in Larimer County. And in 2018-19, we visited 379 classrooms in 56 schools in the Poudre, Thompson, and Weld school districts. And our, our typical tellers up until would go to our classes once a month and usually spend about 30 minutes telling our stories. And we were doing that typically every month. We logged uh, in 1918-19 school year nearly 69,000 child experiences. And we go under, undergo compre a very comprehensive training to be storytellers. And, uh, and of course, background checks as well. And our primary audiences include children from kindergarten through fifth grade, uh, but we also volunteer at uh, community events and senior center centers, centers and independent living centers as well. Enough of that. Uh, let me first introduce Paul Murphy, who is going to tell his story today. Well, thanks, Mike. And um, the first thing I'm going to do is I always do when I tell stories is I have my um, very special storytelling cap. And I like to tell everybody um, almost every story in the world is right inside here. And the only way I get to tell them is when I put that hat on because it kind of goes down um, through my head. So I'm going to do that. And then I want to thank everybody for inviting me um, into your house. And I'm grateful that you are now here in part of my house um, to do this. So I have a, uh, a story tonight. Um, it's a Native American story, and I'm always fascinated by Native American stories because they describe the world we live in in a very unique and different way. And that's why I particularly love those stories. And this happens to be one of them. And the title of this story is called Sky Pushing Poles. Now this story takes place an extremely long, long time ago. So long ago that almost nobody remembers the story except there were storytellers to capture it. And it has come forward since then. And the story begins really when there was no earth. And the great creator, the great Native American creator, decided to create a world for people to live in. And she ended up starting with creating the mountains, the mountains that we see to the west, those high peaks that we're so used to seeing and created all those mountains and some of them covered with trees and plants and continued creating the earth with hills and plains and valleys and then began the process of creating rivers and streams, the Poudre River. And the great creator continued and started making plants, all the trees, the firs, the spruces, the pines, all the aspens, the shrubs that we're used to seeing, the beautiful colored flowers that are out there, the reds, the blues, the purples, lovely flowers. And the great creator continued from that point and created the animals, the bison, the deer, the elk, the squirrels, the chipmunks. And from there went on to create the birds, the eagles, the songbirds, the chickadees, the wrens, the kingfishers, and also created those insects, ooh, spiders and snakes and flies and 
that pesky mosquito, <laughs> all of those kind of things, a great creator made and created a world fit for human beings. And when the great creator got done, she took a step back, admired all she had done and was satisfied. Except the great creator made one mistake. For you see, the great creator made the sky too low. And when the sky was too low, all the adults could not walk upright. They had to bend over because the sky was too low. The trees could not grow to their fullest heights. The birds could not fly way up in the sky. They flew way down low and they were flying in front of people's faces, oftentimes hitting them. Oh, and the clouds, the great white fluffy clouds filled with moisture could not be way up in the sky. They had to drag their big wet bellies along the ground, making everything wet and muddy. And all those creatures that lived underground got so tired of it because it was wet all the time. The sky was too low. But the only ones who weren't bothered by having a low sky were the children. For you see, they could stand up straight. They could run around like they do today. They had no worries and they enjoyed their life. But one day, it was a very young girl and she was out with her friends and they were practicing their sword play and they were using long sticks and this young girl took her stick and she raised it up above her head high enough that the very tip of her stick poked the sky. And when she did, the sky went up. And all the other children were amazed. They looked at it. So like many children do, they all got their own sticks and grabbed onto them and stood there out in the open and yelled out, "Yo ho and raised their sticks and the ends of their sticks poked the sky way up there and lo and behold, the sky went up a little bit more. And they kept doing it, "Yo ho and hitting the sky, watching it go up. Well, of course, the older children saw this and they got longer sticks and came out with their sticks and held on to them and yelled, "Yo ho and up they went. And the ends of those sticks poked the sky and it went up even further. Well, of course, the adults saw this, amazed. They went and got longer sticks, brought them out, held on to them and yelled out, "Yo ho poked the sky and it went up and again, up. And finally, up all the way to where it is today. And everybody was thrilled because now the adults could stand up straight. The birds could fly way up in the sky. The trees could grow to their truest height. The clouds would float in the sky where they really belong. In fact, they were so delighted, they decided to celebrate in this village. And they all went into the longhouse and they had food and started to make music and they were dancing and celebrating the fact that they now could all stand up straight. And this celebration went on and on and like it usually does, the sun eventually began to go behind the sky as darkness came on. And like all times when the sun went behind the sky, it got dark, very dark because that's the way the world worked. And they continued to celebrate until very early in the morning and they began to get tired and decided it was time to stop and for them to leave the longhouse and go to their individual lodges and go to sleep. And so they began to leave the longhouse and as they exited, while it was dark out, they stopped and they looked up to the sky and <gasps> it was amazing. Because you see, every place that somebody pushed their stick up, 
created a hole in the sky that now allowed the sun that went behind the sky to come through in little dots of white, clear, twinkling light. And that's the story of sky pushing poles and how the stars came to be. Thank you. <laughs> I think I'm next here. Sure. Thank you very much, Phil. And here's Diane. Hello, everybody. I've been telling stories in Larimer County and Weld County classrooms for seven years now, and this one is one of my favorites. It takes place in Colorado more than a hundred years ago. And it takes place in a in a somewhere you might have heard. It's called Rocky Mountain National Park. You heard of it? <laughs> it's a wonderful place. It's filled with bighorn sheep and elk and hawks and eagles and bears and moose. But the most wonderful things, the most wonderful things in that park are the mountains. You could see them if you look out somewhere in your neighborhood. There's Mount Meeker, and right next to it, a little bit taller, Long's Peak. They've been there millions of years. Those mountains were there when the Arapaho tribe and the Ute tribe came through, and they were there when the pioneers came, and they came on their horses and their wagons, and most people looked at those big mountains and thought, too big for me, I'm not going there. But one teenager named Enos Mills loved the mountains. While he was working every day, he would look up in the mountains and say, one of these days, I'm going to climb Long's Peak. And he did. When he got to the top of Long's Peak, he looked around and thought it was the most beautiful thing he had ever seen. He decided right then and there that he wanted that to be his job. He would guide people up to the top of Long's Peak so they could see that too. And that's what he did. He became well known. Big, strong cowboys would ride in on their horse and ask Enos Mills to guide them to the top of Long's Peak. One day, Harriet Peters asked him to guide her to the top of Long's Peak. Harriet Peters was not a big, strong cowboy. She was an eight-year-old girl. Well, Enos Mills looked at her he had seen her around town, always running here and there, helping people, lifting heavy things. He knew she was strong and sturdy, but he also knew that no child had ever climbed Long's Peak. And then he remembered a story he heard about little Harriet, that she used to live someplace else with small hills with her mom and dad. And her mom loved hawks so much that they would go up these hills and lie in the grass and look at the sky. And when they saw a hawk circling, they would put their arms out wide like wings and say, hello, hawks, we're as high as you. But sadly, Harriet's mom died. And so her that's when her father brought her to Colorado. Enos Mills knew all this about Harriet, so he said, sure, little girl, I'll take you to the top of Long's Peak if your dad comes along with you. And so it was that a few days later, they met at the bottom of Long's Peak. It was early in the morning before the sun even came up because it takes all day to get up and down that mountain. And there they were a hundred years ago. Now, Harriet's father and Enos Mills wore heavy blue jeans and thick walking boots and a shirt and their jackets buttoned up and their hat. But Harriet, because she was a girl, that lived 100 years ago, wore a dress. She wore a dress to climb a mountain. She put on a pair of pants underneath and she had a jacket on and a bonnet. That's what girls wore then. But she only had one pair of shoes. So those are the ones she wore. And they started out. Now, you need to know that in those days, there were no streets up the mountain. There were no sidewalks, no bike paths. You had to climb over rocks and grasses. And so they started out. At first they saw chipmunks everywhere and a raccoon or two. It was pretty good. And before you know it, Harriet's father started coughing and he couldn't breathe well. 
because the air is thin in the mountains and some people have trouble. And so finally he said, I can't go on any longer. You go without me. Are you sure? And that's when Enos Mills says, Harriet, do you wanna quit? Do you wanna go back down with your father? And she said, no, I wanna keep going. So her father decided he would wait at the bottom for her and they kept going. Harriet was very excited. Now, of course, Enos Mills led most of the way, but sometimes Harriet would get excited and she would skip ahead of him. And on one of these times, she skipped ahead around a giant boulder and on the other side was a very large elk with antlers out to here. And at first he pointed the antlers at her, but he must have changed his mind because he darted off through the woods. Harriet's heart was beating very fast and she decided she would stay behind Mr. Mills. And on they went, they, they walked and climbed all morning. Halfway up the mountain, it was lunchtime. So they sat down on a big rock and ate some lunch. And Harriet looked up in the sky and way up high, she saw a dot going in a big circle. She couldn't tell if it was a hawk, the kind of hawk her mother loved because she still wasn't high enough. So they kept going. It was getting colder. There was snow on the ground, even though it was summer, and the trees were getting shorter the higher they went. And then Harriet started limping. She was limping because her foot hurt. And Mr. Mills noticed and he said, are you okay? I see you're limping. And she said, I'm okay. And he said, do you want to quit? Do you want to go back down? And what do you think she said? No, let's keep going. So on they went, but still she limped until finally Mr. Mills said, stop and take your shoe off. I want to take a look at that foot of yours. And when she did, he could see that she had a huge blister on her foot and it was bleeding. Her, that old shoe had been rubbing, rubbing on her skin. So he took a clean handkerchief out of his pocket and wrapped her foot like a bandage and she put her shoe back on and she tried it out and he said, well, do you need to go back down? Do you want to quit? And once again, she said, no, let's keep going. Up they went, colder, colder, higher, higher, till there were no trees. Kept climbing and climbing, and Harriet was just about to say, maybe I can't make it to the top. But that's when Mr. Mills turned around and said, you did it, girl, you're on the summit. And he pulled her up one last rock, and she stood on the top of Long's Peak. She was looking down on the other mountains. She saw a million trees everywhere. She loved it up there. And then she looked up in the sky. She was so high up that she could see that it was a hawk flying in a big circle over her head. And she thought of her mom and she put her arms out like wings and said, Mama, look, I'm as high as a hawk. She had done it, the first child to ever climb Long's Peak. And I think there was probably a smile on Harriet's face all the way down the mountain. And that is the true story of Harriet Peters climbing Long's Peak. And I have a question for you. Do you think you could ever climb a mountain? Maybe. <laughs> Thank you so much, Diane. I love that story. Well, you know, you can see behind me that uh, I, I'm I'm in a right in front of Elizabeth Auntie Stone and the women who tamed the West, and back you know when Abraham Lincoln was still the president of the United States, women started coming west. Now many of them came and. Conestoga wagons with their husbands and their families, but some came all by themselves because there was great opportunity for women in the West, opportunity that they couldn't find back East. But it was a very difficult time for these women. Their chores were so difficult. For instance, many of these women had between eight and 12 children, but many of the children died because of the difficult conditions. But the reason you had so many children is you needed workers to help farm the land and bring the water and the wood and things of this sort. 
but these women were so rugged and you know they were the ones that sewed the clothes they're the ones that cooked all of the food they're the ones that that cleaned their cabins why you know they're the ones that helped others in the family take the weekly bath you had to bring the water in from far away in the well and then you heat it up and at least three people would use the bath water and then after the bath water was used by at least three, the water itself was used to wash some of the overalls and things of that sort. And then they would take that water if they had a wooden floor and they'd use that water to wash the floors with. So, so these women worked so hard, but by the same token, because there were so many opportunities here, do you know four times as win many women in the West became lawyers and doctors than the same women in the East. They had this great opportunity. And in addition, they're the folks who created the schools and, and they created the libraries and the hospitals and of course, the churches. Now, there was one very special woman that you may have heard of. Her name was Elizabeth Stone, but everybody called her Auntie. Andy and her husband, a judge, came to Camp Collins, which later became Fort Collins, when Andy was in 1864. They ran the, uh, the, the mess hall for the soldiers there, and then, Three years later, the soldiers left, but Annie, whose husband by this time had died, went on to create a personal job, and she see how bad so much of that was wiped out. So she said, I'm going to build a brick kiln, and she began then to build this building, which turned out bricks for all of the houses and the buildings in Fort Collins. And then there was the situation with all of the farmers who had to bring their wheat in to make flour, but they had to go all the way to Cheyenne, Wyoming. Oh no, Andy said, we're not gonna have that. I'm gonna build a flour mill. This flour mill, a grist mill, was three stories high. It was big that Annie could also use the top floor for her own living quarters and she could take in borders. Now, in addition to all those other things that Annie did, she was the first woman to take to help another woman have a baby. And you heard about the land grant where you could apply for up to 160 acres of land. Annie was one of the first women not only to do that, she had to work that land seven months a year for five years, which she did. But in addition to that, she became the first woman landowner and the first woman taxpayer. That's the story of Annie Stone that just continued on giving. You, you know, she started the first school, but then she also was responsible, along with others, for creating the first college in Larimer County, which later became Colorado State University. Annie lived till 19, till she was 94 years old, and she cast her vote in 1894, a year before she died, and a year after all of Colorado gave women the right to vote. Now today, Annie is recognized as the mother of Fort Collins, and you can see her house preserved in the Liberty, in the, in the Library Park, right next to the Pooter Library in downtown. It's there and preserved. And in addition to that, there is an Annie Stone Street in Fort Collins. Now, you can learn more about all of these women and Annie in a book called Staking Her Claim, written by Marcia Meredith Hensley. It's available at uh, the Pooter Library, but I hope Kaylee will soon have it as well in the Crestview.library. 
Now, before I leave, I want to share with you something that I found so interesting about the story that I told you. Are you ready? Here it is. <laughs> So that's the story of Andy Stone, and of course you saw the Elizabeth Hotel, guess where they got their name. So that's my story, and I guess, Callie, we are open for questions, if anyone has them, before we go. I see some chats. They weren't questions. We were having a little, I think, some connection issues with the audio. But I just want to let everyone know I am recording this tonight. So if you would like me to share that with you, you can just send me an email. It's just my first name, K-A-L-I at clearviewlibrary.org. And I'd be happy to share the video with you. Um, it will probably also go up on our library YouTube page as well. Um, I'm not sure when, though. So um, sending me an email would probably be the best bet to get that as well. So I'd be happy to share this with anyone. Sure. Um, but yeah, if anybody has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself now. Um, let's see. Mike, I think we're still seeing your screen. I got your web, your page up there, Mike, Sharon. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, goodness. Where is it here? You are sharing the screen. I don't want to do that. Is that off now? Up oh, there. Perfect. Not good on technical issues here. <laughs> hey guys, just want to say thank you for representing Larimer, Diane, and Mike and Phil. Yay! Thanks, Kaylee, for having them. Yeah, yeah it was really fun. Thank you. Great job. And, and Callie and all, you, you know, we're struggling now with spellbinders. We don't know what our situation is going to be this fall, but I know several of us have created our YouTube uh, sites, YouTube channels. Uh, you, can find, uh, you can find my stories, including this one on, uh, on uh, Mike Forty Storyteller on YouTube. And Phil, where do they find your stories? Yep. You, 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 um, I can't remember off the top of my head what the address is, um, but I can send it over to Callie if she wants to have that. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you, Callie, and thanks to Diane and Phil uh, to, uh, to join us there. I'm sorry my sound didn't go on as well, uh, but, you know, I tried to put another microphone on. That didn't seem to work either, so. It was pretty good, just would stop once in a while. Ah. Yeah, I think it was just a little bit of a connection issue. We got most of it, though, so. That's good. Well, you know, as you get older, you have to stop every while. And, and <laughs> Nora is with us. And by the way, Nora is one of the founders. Nora Eaton is one of the founders of Spellbinders. And she's here with us today. And you had a whole group of people there with you, Nora. And you're on mute. So you, now you're on mute. Open up your mic. Up in the corner, right okay. corner, there you are. Hi there, everybody. Uh, Hi, Nora. Everybody for the excellent job you did tonight. Mm -hmm. um, I hope this tells you how effective storytelling can be. And I'm so glad to hear about the stories about Colorado and everything. And as storytellers, we have so many different stories to share uh, about all kinds of things. So, Kelly, I hope you invite us back. We'd love to have more sessions with you, I guess. Yeah. And to reach another audience. So, you know. Yeah. So thanks again, everybody. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you so much you, for Callie. doing this and being flexible with us as we move things online this summer. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We appreciate your experiment here. <laughs> <laughs> we do. <laughs> oh, dear. Okay. Oh, nice. Okay, good. Thank you. All right. Do we have anything else? Any more comments, questions? No. Oh, okay. Thank you, Callie. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you. you mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for spending your Tuesday evening with us.
Yeah. yeah, make sure if anybody has any questions or follow up, go ahead and send me an email. Um, but otherwise, we'll go ahead and say good night, I think. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Bye. See you guys. Bye bye for bye. now. Bye. Mm.